Hi, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Welcome. Good to see everyone. It's Monday. I believe it's Monday, still Monday, <laughs> April 27th. Let me make myself a bit bigger. A little bit blurry this morning. My internet is what it is. So let me know where you're from. Let me know your name. What's new in your world? Uh, I don't even know if we should count the weeks anymore. What is this? Week six? Week six? Week seven? Hi, Angela. Welcome. Oakland, Maryland. I'm actually sending a package to Bethesda tomorrow. So I had to double check my Maryland geography a little bit. Katie's here from Ottawa. Week six, according to Angela. Hi, Melissa from San Antonio. Thomas from Southwest Florida. So is that on the panhandle, Thomas? Where is that? What's considered Southwest Florida? I guess the panhandle is probably north. Let me know. My Florida geography is not so great. Good morning. Naples, Naples, Florida. Okay, so near Tampa. So I do know where Tampa is. We were on a cruise maybe two years ago, three years ago from Barcelona, Spain. It was supposed to go all the way around the tip of Florida to Tampa. And we had storm. There were there was, I don't know if it was a hurricane or it was a storm at sea, uh, but there was definitely, we were not able to make it all the way to Tampa to dock. They took us to, I believe, Fort Lauderdale. And that ended up being perfect, actually, because we were headed to Disney World. And so that was a little bit closer than actually going all the way around to Tampa. So welcome. Cheryl Ann's here from High River. Welcome. Week seven. Jean's here from Acton, Massachusetts. Definitely. I don't know about you guys, but over the weekend, maybe a little bit at the end of last week, it just kind of sucked. Yeah. <laughs> so things sucked for a day or two. Needed lots of chocolate. Uh, tried to go on more walks. Tried to watch a little bit more TV. but definitely, you know, many days are good. And there's always something good in every day. But definitely, uh, yeah, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. Well, I guess Wednesday when I had my emergency family emergency, a little bit of last week sucked. So if it's sucking for you today, I feel you I hear you. Um, yeah, not every day is great. So welcome. We've got uh, lots of people today. Katie says she wants to give a shout out to the parents teaching their kids online. Katie's a parent and teacher and it is not working. Yeah, I hear you. I think um, there's so many different schools of thought. You know, do you let your kids have fun and just do as much teaching as is required, but then they fall behind if it's a formative year for them, if it's a uh, important year for them. It's definitely a challenge, right? And even people who get along with their spouses and their routines, things like that. It's, it's, this is a whole other scenario. So um, if things are not working for you this week, I hear you. If you're having a good week, let us know. If you had a good weekend, let me know. I've, we've got a couple people here today. I see some of our presenters. So we're going to have a great panel session today in about 20 minutes. I'm just gonna go ahead and upload that file while I'm waiting. If you're just joining us, say hello. Otherwise, you've got me. I, I don't have anything prepared this morning. I was not super organized. Uh, one second. Nope. Sorry guys, I just want to upload this file before I forget. So we'll have it when we need it. Uh, hi, Jill from Ames, Iowa. Jill is also on our committee. So I guess I'll give you guys a little bit of background. Hi, Jennifer from Ohio. Um, the people who are going to be presenting today are mostly people I've met electronically. So about um, 
oh geez, a month ago, over a month ago, I joined in on the Redwoods group. They have a call on Thursday mornings and I joined in on the first call. And during that call, I overheard Kelly Martinez from the city of Phoenix, Arizona, ask on the Redwoods call, how she and her organization should prepare for the summer. So how would they go ahead or go about recruiting all of their lifeguards? They have 29 outdoor pools. They typically have a staff of, I believe 400 or 500. And so she asked on the Redwoods call, what should we be doing? How should we prepare? And unfortunately at that point in time, they weren't able to address her question in a way that I thought was meaningful. I was on that call and I texted Kelly about her question and we were talking a few days later about this same issue and that prompted the creation of what I've been calling the high volume committee. So there's about 14 of us from all over the United States. We've got Virginia, California, Arizona, Iowa, um, Texas, and we've just been connecting weekly or bi-weekly via Zoom to see what kind of strategies people are working on in their department, in their area, every state and province being different in terms of um, stay at home orders, shelter in place orders, prohibitions against swimming or using beaches. So we've been trying to address some different topics and we don't have all the answers. We don't have a black or white, this is what you should be doing, but hopefully by several people in this committee, I volunteered them to share hopefully by sharing, you can get some ideas starting to head in that direction. Now, I know a lot of states, and especially in Canada, our Canadian provinces, were really not looking at reopening our swimming pools in Canada. I can speak to Canada until late June, early July, so we still have the benefit of a lot of time. Certainly in um, Calgary, so I live outside the city of Calgary in Alberta, which is the province north of Montana, our um, provincial health officer, uh, doctor of health, has banned all public gatherings in the city of Calgary until August 31st. So we can anticipate that we will not be seeing much happening in the city of Calgary pool wise, spray park wise, splash park wise uh, this summer. That doesn't mean that pools will be prohibited from opening on a scaled or a limited basis, but certainly saying that there's no public gatherings in the city of Calgary until August 31st gives you a very clear, firm, um, what we can expect. So whether that changes in terms of a gathering being 10 people is okay, but 50 people is not, I think we are in uncharted territory, certainly in Canada. And so I wanted to bring our uh, presenters together who are mostly American from different perspectives to share what their thoughts are. So if you're just joining us, let us know where you're from. So Jill has been part of that group. We've got Evan here as well, Drew here. We're gonna have several people presenting today. Welcome Kim from North Texas. Welcome Catherine from Saskatoon. If you're just joining us, let me know where you're from. Susan's here from St. Augustine, Florida. Josh is here, Joshua, excuse me, from Seattle, Washington. So we got good kind of geographic spread today. Let me know where you're from. Uh, if you were here on Friday, those show notes are not yet up. I was, uh, I was quite busy this weekend. I'm teaching certified pool operator online this week. So I'm a bit behind in the process where I download the file, upload the show notes and all of that. But I do have the recording. They will be uploaded in the next day or two. Uh, we had two mug winners on Friday, so Evan was one of them. I'm trying to remember who was the second person. Um, I believe it was Ashley, Ashley Rowe from uh, Nanaimo, BC, and then Evan from uh, near in Northern Virginia. So thanks to those of you that participated in the mug competition. Uh, we'll be having, uh, by we, I mean Lakeview Aquatic Consultants, we're going to have a competition later on Facebook this week. It won't be tied to the webinar, so if you're interested, we will have a competition on our Facebook page later towards the end of this week. If you follow us on Facebook, you'll have the chance to um, win something I don't normally give away. So I will give that sneak peek. Let me go ahead and put some links in the chat box. If you're just coming in, let us know where you're from. Also let us know what particular areas of aquatics or your job are stressing you out maybe right now. That gives us some good background to address. 
Ian is here from Japan. Welcome, Ian. I can't even imagine what time is it currently in Japan. It's probably you're ahead of us by probably 15 or 16 hours. So welcome. Let us know how you found out about the webinars. I see Alana here from Brilliant, uh, Wisconsin. Hannah's here from Cold Lake. Welcome, Hannah. Caitlin's here from Shakopee, Minnesota. Leslie's here from Camrose. Thank you, Leslie, for your comment. So I've just pinned our Facebook page in the chat box if you're interested in looking out for the competition we're doing for a free giveaway later this week. Ben's here from Baylor. Deborah's back from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Welcome. So interesting, Deborah, I'll tell you, my husband is a retired US Army and so for many, many years had a security clearance as a defense contractor, never ever had any intention of going to Cuba. And then about a year ago, we realized that he was eligible for Canadian citizenship. He's been a permanent resident for long enough. And the first thing he said to me was, can we go to Cuba if I get a Canadian passport? So he obviously doesn't have a security clearance anymore, but going to Cuba, uh, Canada does not have a trade embargo with Cuba. And actually, Canada is one of the largest uh, tourist sending countries to Cuba. Typically, a million Canadians go to Cuba every year. So that is on our list for when travel resumes. Uh, welcome, Carmen from Richmond Hill. Let me go ahead and I will pop in a couple of links for upcoming stuff. So for reminder to everyone, we do have webinars extended until at least May 11th. So I've been adding additional webinars. I will be releasing additional webinars either tomorrow, Tuesday, or Wednesday. All of those announcements are made first on our Facebook page. So follow us on Facebook for the most up-to-date information on sessions that we add. I have about six different sessions in the works. It just depends on, obviously, like you guys know, speaker availability, timing, workload, childcare, schooling. So we, we just see who we can get that I've asked. So all of the new, um, um, excuse me, all of the new sessions will be on Facebook first, and then you can register from the main site. I also want to let you know on Wednesday, so two days from now, I'll pop the registration link in the chat box. We will have our Junior Lifeguard Club uh, session. So that is not geared only to Life Saving Society uh, people. That is geared towards anyone who's interested in developing a, a youth after school activity, a youth networking group, a way that you can connect your at-risk youth with first aid training, life-saving skills, different social activities. I'm um, just scrolling back. Joshua is asking, staffing is a big concern, working for the University of Washington, having students on campus may not happen until the fall and you rely on the student body for staffing needs. So Joshua, that sounds very similar. We're gonna hear briefly today from Andrew at the University of California from Santa Barbara. And I know that was a concern for him as well. All the students were sent home, so dorms were closed. Uh, there is no student population to draw upon naturally, so that's a change. Melissa is saying that they have a therapeutic heated pool for military patients. Not sure how things will change. Once you reopen, still unsure looking for verbiage, health and safety tips, supplies for patients. So I'm assuming, Melissa, you're at a VA hospital somewhere in the US. And it's definitely, we're not gonna have all the answers today for verbiage, but I love um, one of the perspectives Andrew's gonna bring with health and safety, his background, something called journey mapping was mind blowing for me. And I think that's something we're all going to have to work on. So a uh, Department of Defense hospital. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Deborah says you're stuck inside, so you're living on, on post, so can't go sightseeing. Well, we'll connect and I'll send you some photos. I mean, I assume that it's a restricted uh, it's a restricted base, but I do also have an ID card, so we could go both ways. Although they'd probably ask why we were trying to come on post, because we both have ID cards. So welcome everyone. If you're just joining us, let us know where you're from, what particular areas of your job right now, aquatics under COVID are stressing you out. We're gonna address today in our panel, a couple of the areas we've been working on. It's not gonna be comprehensive. It's not gonna be exhaustive. I've just asked some individuals that have some great ideas to share what they're working on. I did not task them with a four hour presentation or project. I mean, we're all busy. 
So I ask them to present on topics that are of interest to them or relevant to their facility. And hopefully you can get some good ideas from that to get you started. So Cascade, Idaho, welcome Michelle. I see Natalie from Indiana, Stephanie from Northampton, Massachusetts. Hi Dana from Bonneville. So staffing issues when we reopen is a major concern. So especially those of you in rural communities, what does that look like if people had to relocate due to lack of jobs? Did they move to the city? Were they forced to relocate perhaps to family members or parents in other parts of the country or province? So staffing in our rural communities is, is going to be a huge concern. I hear you, Dana. Renee is here from Overland Park, Kansas. Alyssa is here from Frederick, Maryland. Alyssa, I don't know if you were here last week when I talked about, we just watched the National Geographic mini series, The Hot Zone about Ebola, and it's all done in um, Fort Detrick at Frederick, Maryland. So if you need nightmares, uh, in addition to the coronavirus, uh, The Hot Zone on Nat Geo is, yeah, it, it definitely takes your mind off of the current situation. Ben is asking about personal protective equipment, masks for reopening. I mean, that's a huge one, whether it's N95, just a, a cotton mask, filter, particulate filter, whether that's a proper actually fitted filter with filter cartridges. Alyssa is saying that she's two blocks from that Fort Tetrick building, the bunker. Other topics Joshua has been thinking about, uh, no restrictions, just equitable facility usage and programming. No restrictions, we'll get to whatever we can get to, but I definitely think programming, we won't hit on it too much today, but that's definitely something that everybody in our committee has been thinking about. How do you address swimming lessons? How do you address free swim, like open swim? How do you address lane swim? Some things such as an aqua fitness class may appear easier to organize, but then other things such as swimming lessons, depending on the age, is more contact-based. Um, hello, Ashley from Austin, Texas, Jennifer from Emporia, Kansas. Uh, Aiko is asking about, does anyone know any other suppliers that makes waterproof masks? So does anyone have any tips? Let us know. Excuse me, a support for a waterproof masks. I'm also just going to, one second, I'm just changing the view. We discovered on Friday that we can have question mode. So Deborah has done question mode for us, perfect timing. So you guys know if you've been to these webinars before, we just discovered on Friday question mode. So now when I turn on question mode, in your chat box where it says type your message, if you hit the exclamation mark, it will allow you to make your box blue, which is helpful. Right, so literally there is, oh, there's no way you're gonna see that. If you uh, click the question mark as Deborah has done, it allows me, the presenter, or any of our panelists to better see questions. So Deborah is asking, determining pool capacity, entry limits, spacing, lane use limitations, ramifications for rescues if needed, how do we set an age limit for pool use? I don't have all the answers, I'm afraid. I think if you're on this chat and you have any ideas, pop them in the chat box. I mean, off the cuff for me, I think the number has been floating around. I haven't seen it in writing, but a quote from the CDC has been floating around saying 25% bather load capacity of a facility. So if your pool can have 450 people, that you should not have more than 112 people, that being 25% capacity. But as you guys know, capacity is very hard to limit. Do you do it at the front desk? How do you get people to go out and come in? I personally am a fan of clearing the pool at set intervals. So perhaps on a statutory holiday in Canada where we're offering a free swim, I prefer to clear the pool every hour and everybody has to leave. And then if they choose to come back in or if we do not let them come back in, that ensures that a whole new set of people comes in and in this situation, we'd have to incorporate sanitizing. So lots of questions to consider. Lee is here from Virginia Beach. Hello, Marilyn from Owen Sound. Julie from Perryville, Montana. Uh, excuse me, Missouri. I think that's Missouri, not Montana. Uh, I believe MN is Montana. Jody's here from Pima County in Tucson, Arizona. 
Elizabeth from Northern Virginia, Ashley from Memphis. Uh, Ashley, I need to send an invite to Adam again. Yes, I can. One second. So if you're just joining us, let us know where you're from, what specific things in aquatics are stressing you out right now, what are you working on? Ashley, I've just sent that to Adam directly from the software. I see Kim from Hawkesbury, Christine from Las Vegas, Jennifer is here from Maine, Diane from Wainwright, hello Diane, Elizabeth from Baltimore, Melissa from Colorado, Sherry from Texas. A lot of your names I'm recognizing now, those of you that requested a sticker. So last call for stickers, if you'd like to do a trade, I would love to get one of your stickers or magnets from your aquatic department. If you don't have one, I'm happy to just send you one of mine. So I'll pop that in the chat box now. I see Heather from Chicago, Kathy from Plano, Rick is here from Santa Barbara, Stephanie from North Richland, Texas, working on social distancing plan for team members and guests. So I glad, I'm glad, Stephanie, you mentioned that team members, staff is also an important piece. I think a lot of people are not thinking about staff congregating in the lunchroom, staff congregating in the pool office, staff congregating at the front desk. And by congregating, I don't mean wasting time. I mean serving customers and standing close together. Cheryl's here from Duluth, Minnesota. Anastasia is here from Pennsylvania. Lynn from Allentown, lots of Pennsylvania. Sherry's working on multiple reopening dates, uh, about five, so that's really hard. How soon, right? One week, three weeks, five weeks, eight weeks. Hello, Renee. I'll pin the sticker request, so last call for stickers. If you'd like a sticker, fill out the form. Uh, so Stephanie's asking, what address can we send you a sticker? So I have put my return address on the envelope, and then you can also go to our website, lakeviewaquaticconsultants.com, and the address is currently up on our contact page. So you'll see it on the return address label. Uh, yes, <laughs> send me a St. John's Legends magnet, Chris, that would be great. If you don't have stickers, that's okay. It doesn't have to be a trade. If you'd like a sticker, I will send you a sticker regardless of trading or not. Welcome, if you're just joining us, we'll start in a few minutes. I'm just scrolling. Thanks, Michelle's offering to send a sticker from Idaho. Paul's here from Reno. So staffing is a concern also at a university. Uh, Will is here, so Willa will be presenting as well today. We have five different panelists, so welcome. Sarah is here from Texas. Joaquin is here. If you would like a sticker, Joaquin, fill in the Google form that I have pinned in the chat box. I will finish up those envelopes this week. I've sent out, I think I did about 45 yesterday, so I'll do the rest this week. Probably have to order some more stamps, but that's a good problem to have. Uh, John's here from Old Bridge. Uh, Cindy's here from North Carolina. Charles from Beaverton, Oregon, Connecticut. More Ottawa, Vancouver. Just scrolling, we've got lots of people coming in here. So welcome everyone. So I'll give a little bit of background on the committee and then in a minute or two we'll get started respecting your time. Basically this committee of people who's presenting today is a selection of a group that came together in late March, early April. A lot of us got connected through my Instagram account, so the Lakeview Aquatic Consultants Instagram, and we were just looking to address a lot of these questions that are now percolating out in the Facebook groups that I'm sure you all belong to about how do we do this? How do we do that? What is the right way? I mean, everybody's looking for an answer. And unfortunately, I don't think there is one answer. I think there's a big problem right now. I appreciate all of this collective sharing. I appreciate everybody looking to share on the Facebook groups. But I think we need to be aware that many of us might be experts in aquatics, but we're not experts in pandemics or epidemiologists or risk management. And so our scope is very finite and we have to be careful working outside of our scope. And we also have to be careful if we adopt 100% the policy, the procedure, um, the process of a facility near to us because we don't know what thought or lack of thought went into that. And in a legal situation, me saying, Katie, well, I took the, the pool 
a plan to reopen from Okotoks down the street or from High River or from Nanton, that's not going to help me in a court of law if I make a bad decision. And so I understand that people are terrified of making the wrong decision. And so they're looking for other examples that they can copy or duplicate. But I would encourage everyone today as we're going through this session to really think about this is the time to have autonomy. This is the time to really stick your feet down and as an organization or as a department, really decide what your ethics and morals are and where you stand in terms of what is correct, what is suitable and what is compliant to your local legislation, whether municipal, whether state, whether provincial, whether federal, whether um, organizational. So there's a really a lot that goes into this. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I got sidetracked. I started to talk about the committee. So we've been meeting weekly or biweekly on Zoom and we are basically just working through all of the same issues that all of you are working through now. We're, we, we're not any more subject matter experts. The whole goal today is to share what we've been working on. And when I say we, I'm what everybody in the group has been working on and then get you to start thinking about different aspects of what you can work on. Um, yeah, so that's the plan. We have a couple of people. So I'll start my introduction and let me just, I want to, Willa, I'm going to make you a presenter and then I'll start my introduction because it's going to be Willa, then Evan. So let me find you in the box, Willa, one second. Okay, so I'm going to do my introduction and then I'll introduce what we're what the plan is for today and I'll pull up the PowerPoint. So if you're just joining us, welcome. We're ticking up there in numbers. It is Monday, May, May? no, nope, not quite. Monday, April 27th, 2020. We're heading into part two of the webinars. So if you're here today, then you know the webinars are continuing as long as I can provide quality webinars when I reach a point where the quality is not there then we'll take a break, then we'll stop. So the plan today is we're gonna hear from five different people on the high volume committee. Our five different people, I'm gonna announce the order because it reminds everyone. So first we're gonna have Willa Suter, then we're gonna have Evan McGuirin, then we're gonna have Andrew Yorkey, then we're gonna have Adam, Tom, is it Thompson I believe, forgive me, and then I'll round out the end. And so you know the format is, I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint, they're each gonna have I don't know, some of them will have five minutes, some of them might have 10 to 12 minutes. They're gonna present on the topic that's most of interest to them or that they've been working on. I will do a couple max to maybe three questions for them at the end of their session, and then we'll move on to the next presenter, okay? So I don't have a good sense of how long the total time will take. Stay with us as long as you can. If you have to leave, the session is currently recording. The PowerPoint, I do have to upload on the show notes. So I'll just put the show notes in the box for now. And then once Willa gets started, I will go silent and upload the PowerPoint there. So let me pull up the PowerPoint and then we will welcome Willa Suter from Virginia. Willa, do you want to try your camera and mic? And I will go small. Whoops, we lost the one second. Perfect. As well. Am I heard? Can chat box let us know that you can hear Willa and I will turn off my camera and my and I'm gonna put in an earbud so we don't double down on sound. So we can hear some yeses. Let's give some welcomes to Willa in the chat box because I I've pretty much heard these people. So it's it's a little bit terrifying to present to 200 people. So be kind. It can be. Thankfully, it's a lot of well-known names from AOAP conferences and getting to know people through these webinars over the past few weeks. So hello to everybody there. Um, I did take a hint from Kelly and decided to stand up for my presentation. Um, so just a little bit about where I'm coming from. I'm in Northern Virginia, outside DC. I work for a planned residential community. We're comparable to a pool management company. We're comparable to a park district. We're comparable to a city. We're 
a little bit of an anomaly in what we do. We are technically a homeowners association, which often means that we outsource our lifeguarding or pool operations to a management company. But based on our size, it's more beneficial of, for us to have an in-house pool service parks and rec department. So we do. And aside from pools, we also have a tennis staff, events, community wide events, um, trips, 55 plus senior programming, tennis, if I didn't already mention that, and we maintain our own tot lots and pathways and, and common areas for the community use. So we own and operate 15 outdoor seasonal pools. That's one of our destination pools in the picture there. And we need about 300 aquatic staff members to make that happen. And that was one of the commonalities of our group, this small committee that came together is that we all had a high volume demand for staff. So we wanted to address things that were becoming critical or are of greatest importance to those high volume groups. So I have a neighbor facility who's probably going to have a lot of the same policies and procedures and dates and planning that I am. And he needs six lifeguards to get that done. So that's where our commonalities end. And yeah, let me go into it. We were going to have another presenter here from A Beautiful Pools in Texas. They are a pool management company, so they represent a bunch of different HOAs and provide their lifeguards and pool operations and openings and closings. And they've had their representative who was on our committee, Heather, has provided us with some samples of communication that that group sent to their clients and they are exceptional. They are, you know, making sure that the clientele knows everything that they can possibly know. And I wanted to give her that kudos while we talk a little about communication. So know your stakeholders in who, in who you're communicating with and consider what each group actually needs to know. Our community members might need more or less information than our vendors. Our senior leadership team might need to know that you've done all the possible research, you have every single detail vetted out, but they might not need to know those details. So consider what everybody needs to know and be proactive as much as possible with your communication. Having a weekly update right now for your different stakeholder groups is not overcompensating. It's it's fair. People do want information as soon as it's available. If your governor or providence leader or training agency is providing you with new information and that's of interest to your stakeholder groups, then pass that on as you get it. Sometimes it's fair to just forward exactly what you read instead of distilling it down and potentially influencing or biasing the information. Pass on the direct word. So be ready for reactions. They're going to happen. You know, we're disappointed. We've we've lost part of what we do and part of what we love. Um, people are going to be disappointed. Their people will be angry. And there will be misplaced blame. That's something to be ready for in advance. Um, you know, if a hotel near me manages to turn it around and reopen four days after our stay-at-home order, kudos to them. That's fantastic. We won't be able to do that. The size of our agency won't be able to accommodate that turnaround on a dime. So we just want to be as proactive as possible. And I mentioned this, this do what you love quote, which I'm sure is hanging up in, in a lot of offices across the country and speaking to some of us much more dearly now than it has in the past. But I also want to reference this more realistic version that that I've found to be true for myself, which is that if you do what you love, you you do work. You work every day of your life. You have no separation, no boundaries, and you take everything very, very seriously, very, very personally. So when you're communicating, be human and be honest. Give your stakeholders the information that they want. And if you're having a horrible time dealing with the fact that USA Swimming just canceled two of their 
national qualifying events and is redirecting things to have regional events at a different time. If that's upsetting to you, share that. That's genuine. And being genuine will speak volumes, even when you're just delivering disappointing and and sad or negative information. So stick it out. Be nice. But yeah, I saw someone mention in the chat box the A Beautiful Pools needs over 1,200 lifeguards. So they have a huge, you know, an uphill battle and maybe three of them go to one pool and 20 go to another. But they have a, a very delicate balancing act that they need to go through in terms of their client stakeholders versus their staff stakeholders versus, you know, all the all the different parties involved. Each different organization they represent has different needs. But one of the needs that we all have in common is supplies. Part of this group we went through, I worked with Jill in Idaho or Iowa. I'm forgetting exactly where she's from. Um, Iowa, thanks Katie, um, to come up with a list of supplies. And that master list that we came up with is something we can give to Katie and maybe upload in the show notes. Um, your plumbing parts, your mechanical parts, first aid, retail, program supplies, every single thing that we could possibly think of, we pulled from you know the list from six years ago, the list from six days ago, the new list that includes a non-contact non thermal forehead reading thermometer, which maybe we're gonna do, maybe we're not. We're following that science. Um, we're sticking in some of our preferred vendors and yeah, we can definitely share that. But it's important to know, I know some of us are in a, a spending freeze. I've heard that from a lot of municipalities. And tell your vendor, you know, if they're if they're expecting an $800 order for swimsuits, reach out. Say, hey, we're in a freeze. This is what's going on. Do you have any way for us to reserve these items? Do you have any way of us Placing the order now with a promise to pay, you know, every agency is going to be a little different. Work with your procurement staff and legal staff to make sure that's a legit thing to do. But talk to them. You know, these companies, they need our business as much as we need their supplies. So open that chain of communication. If you've not had it before, if you've just ordered online, pick up the phone, find an old email, ask for that person by name, tell them your situation. They might have you know, ways that they can go about reserving items that you need or allowing you to set up a short-term purchase order where you can get the supplies in hand now and then you have a net 30, 60, 90 days to make an actual payment. Um, I know in a lot of municipalities in the U.S. have a June, July fiscal switch. So if you can't pay for anything until after July 1st, but you want to open on July 1st and you need those things, talk to them. And this is another place where you can talk to your neighbors. I've been on a couple calls with some other people in Northern Virginia, and I know that not all of my pools will open this summer. We have 15. Some were already offline, non-COVID related for renovation and construction. That means I have an excess of backboards. I have an excess of BBMs. I have an excess of rescue tubes. I have an excess um, mobile lifeguard chairs, you know, if those are the differences between opening and not opening, having an open communication about your agency's specific modest needs with your neighbors could, could get you to a more opening ready place. So contacting your vendors, I just mentioned, and make sure that you're referring your chain of command to what you need. If you're in a spending freeze, it's all the more important to share this list of, hey, you know, fire and rescue came in and they wiped out all our gloves. We need to order $400 worth of gloves. If we don't order it now, if you make us wait until the end of the freeze, we're looking at a two week turnaround or a four week turnaround or things that are gonna impact opening. So make sure your chain of command, even if it's in writing from you, and nobody ever answers, at least you've done your due diligence in making sure that that information went up the chain of command. All right, 
Something else that you can work on right now, other than getting your, your supplies in order, is getting your protocols figured out. Protocols that we've potentially never had to have before. What if a staff member or a program participant calls out sick? You know, it's the third day of swim lessons, fast forward into dream world when we're all open and running our programs. And mom calls and says, hey, we're not gonna be at lessons today. Jimmy's not feeling well. Can Jimmy come back tomorrow? He's not feeling well and we just came out of a pandemic. He's in a class with three or four other three or four year olds. What's gonna be their responsibility before we let them come back to the program? What about a staff member who calls out? I'm not feeling well today. I can't be on the stand. I'm not gonna be in. Okay, they wanna come back tomorrow. They've been able to call out before for a day or two days at a time. Is that the same case now? Post pandemic, do they need a test before they can come back? Do they need to just automatically be out for two weeks if they can't get a test? How are we going to react to staff members and program participants missing scheduled time because they're sick? And then a level up from that, how are we going to respond to staff members and program participants who actually do test positive for COVID? You know, they call out sick, we say, you know what? Worst case scenario is that you actually do have this virus. We're going to need you to get tested. So they obtain a test. Again, fast forward to a world where they're all immediately and readily available. And they call you back and they say, I'm positive. Well, what's our obligation now? Do we need to inform every other employee that they had physical interaction with? Do we need to inform our entire membership who may have come? to Panda Bear Pool while that employee was working? Do we need to shut down any facility that that program participant or employee went to? Do we need to have it medically disinfected? Um, do we even have medical grade disinfectants? Um, these are protocols that need to come potentially from above our pay grade. You know, this is your risk manager, your general counsel, your legal department. And then whether or not these are enacted might come from board of supervisors or elected officials. But ask these questions now, you know, send those send those things up the chain because you don't want to make that decision at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, say July 3rd before Fourth of July weekend. It's important in the United States. Um, when two people call out and those two people were critical to operations for the very next day. They called out on the third. What, what responsibility do I have as the employer in allowing them or disallowing them to come back on the 4th of July? We want the pool to be open, assuming we can, but where does our responsibility lie in that situation? So start thinking about those protocols and you know, push that question to the people that need to hear it. So our opening plan, this is just my agency. Our pools are running now. A couple of them are, and by running, I just mean they are either filled and circulating or filling with their fill spout and their hose. Right now, this is our typical uh, preseason drain and clean timeline. We generally have all of our pools up and running and we're wrapping up any plaster projects or decking things by May 1st. We typically have two pools that open pre-Memorial Day. They have an extended season, they're heated. So our pools are essentially ready right now. Um, we're gonna keep our pH at somewhere around a 6.5 because we're not open. That is way below our code minimum, but the lower we go, the more effective our chlorine is going to be. And something we're doing this year differently is we're going to use cyanuric acid in our sunny pools. Um, Preseason, right around now, probably sometime in the next week or so, we'll dose those pools. And that's going to decrease our chlorine effectiveness. Um, but we're hoping that between the, the low pH increase in effectiveness and the cyanuric that we balance it as much as possible because we are hoping to maintain these pools till the point of opening. And then if we're not opening, 
till the point of winterization because we need a running, operating, circulating pool to take care of the plaster and to make sure we don't have bug breeding grounds. And that's our plan. Uh, we do have a couple of fountains, splash pads. They're more just art installation fountains. Two of them have touchless activators. We're planning to open those on the same timeline as the pools, have signage and hand sanitizer available. Obviously, the there's no touchable parts of the water. It's just pop jets coming out of the ground or out of walls. So there's no interactive you know, water cannons or buttons or things like that. Um, the one with a button activator, we're just not opening it. It was an easy thing to take off the list entirely. And those are the, the decisions that we need to make sooner rather than later. For staff training, we're launching some virtual and remote orientation materials in late May. These are the same things we used to do in person, but we videoed it. So it gives them a little bit of hours a week when they're expecting more, but this is what we can offer while we're closed. Excuse me. <coughs> and that's being done in a combination of DIY, their own time, some videos they can view and then report back, and then also facilitated video audio calls. So Katie mentioned this before we got started. Your sources, the collaboration within Aquatics just in the past six weeks has been amazing. And joining different groups on Facebook and social media has been amazing. Gather everything you want. Look everywhere you want. But be mindful of everything that you're trusting and relying on. We've got federal standards, state providence standards, county, city, local standards, and your training agency standards. So whoever's the most strict, that's your safest bet. If you abide by the most strict, then you are going above and beyond compared to those other standards or policies or guidelines. So liability is always going to fall on you and your agency, not with the article that you read online. You know, all of our, the groups online are, they're invaluable. I love bouncing ideas off people. I love sharing my opinion there. Um, I got to say, I love Renee's meme collection all about COVID. It's amazing. Um, but keep in mind, if this goes to court, where is the standard? And the standard is always going to be the most strict. So take care of yourself, your agency, do the best that you can for yourself, your agency, your swimmers, your members, and it's good to know what your neighbor is doing, but that doesn't always dictate what you need to do. So thank you all. I hope this was helpful. I will get that big, long supply list to Katie in the next day or two. I'm going to bounce it off Jill again to make sure she and I are both done with it. Um, and Renee, yeah, you got to tag something. Somehow share your, your COVID meme bank with, with everybody here. And... Evan, who is a neighbor of mine, but different training agency, different organization altogether, is going to take over next and talk operations. So thank you all. Thanks, Willa. So I think we'll move right into Evan. Uh, so Willa, you can turn off your camera. Evan, I've unlocked your mic, unlocked your camera. We'll move right into operations. Uh, I think we'll just keep going. Big thing, everyone, if you have thoughts or comments, add them to the chat box. I'm working in the chat box. But again, just to reiterate, if you're joining us a bit late, the goal of this session today is we're not here to give you the answers. We're not here to tell you how to do things. We're just here to highlight areas that we've been thoughtfully considering that we want to poke holes in each other's plans because it's better us than a court case or a legal team. Okay, so take everything we say with a grain of salt, as Willa just finalized saying, you know, we have to refer to all of our codes, but still hope that you can get some value today in terms of perspectives we've considered. And so uh, PowerPoint slides are up on the show notes now as well. Those are pinned in the chat box. And so everyone knows you can move the camera 
AV pod around the screen wherever you want to see Evan. And I'm going to stop talking now, but I do want to introduce Evan uh, from Virginia, and I'll let you get started. Great. Thanks, Katie. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Okay. Thanks, folks. So, yeah, um, my name's Edmund. I'm a, a neighbor of Willis here in Northern Virginia. I'm uh, a park manager with Nova Parks in the Northern Virginia region. Uh, our agency operates five seasonal outdoor water parks in this area. I have been involved with Nova Parks and Aquatics since I started my first job as a lifeguard at 16. And now I'm responsible for one of those five water parks. So, a little bit of background on me, I'm an AFO uh, as of 2016, and we operate with LSN Associates. I'm an instructor for them as well. We generally hire around 250 lifeguards across those five water parks every season. And looking at the past couple of years, on average, we see anywhere from 200 to 250,000 daily general admission guests um, through all five of our water parks in the course of a summer. So Kind of what I wanted to cover here, and I'm, I'm looking in the presenter slides. A few things may not come along, but I'll share what I can. Um, one of the things that I want to put out there is we all sort of have this conversation about what COVID-19 is doing to our facilities, our people, our operations is. Even before this pandemic happened, something, you know, I've started to personally connect with what's going on is my mother starts every single conversation about her will end of life planning stuff like that with if i get hit by the big yellow bus you know the COVID has started to highlight a lot of things that were probably issues beforehand and really just ramped them up to a point where we are asking a lot of these big questions um and part of preparing for that means that we need to get our documentation set um do you have your operations needs documented right now to make sure that the people out there have all the information they need in case you're not around in one way or another? Whether that's, <clears throat> excuse me, whether that's just a general continuity plan for if you're going to be moving into a prolonged shutdown or if you have a reduction in staffing. Um, our agency has just furloughed a, a bit of our workers, so I am now the only one left operating my site. Um, it's a big concern as we move forward about who is responsible for these things, and you need to ask the question, is that going to be me? And if not, how do I help set them up to succeed? Um, as of right now, I bet almost everybody here in this chat has issues in your pump rooms. Uh, think about what doing more with less kind of fixes already in place that you need to address, document, communicate up the chain. Because here in the U.S., we live in a pretty litigious society. And if you're the last one who touched it, it's probably going to be your fault. Um, and taking this time to make sure any staff you have remaining, you're, you're cross-training with, and you're following separation protocols to, to keep those key functions running. And also taking the time, sort of what Willis talked about, what are those kind of quiet problems that may sneak by in the, in the coming weeks and months um, as we all navigate this? Things like BGB drain covers. Um, if you have an outdoor operation, you can see my, my water park there on the screen, I believe. Uh, that's taken from the top of our slide tower. Uh, we're probably going to be throwing an extra coat of wax on those to protect from UV as we have them sit around for an extra couple months if, if I'm the only one there doing that. Um, your chemical deliveries. So uh, we use liquid chlorine at our sites. Uh, right now, all our deliveries are still standing. We have good chlorine availability, but deliveries are on an on-call status. So that means somebody has to monitor, watch the supply, see how much is feeding. Um, or are you on an auto delivery? Does that person who's gonna be making the delivery to your site have access if you're not the one there? And then just other monthly, quarterly, annual safety inspection items that were missed while people are off work. If you have a building with fire extinguishers, AED, other water systems. Um, as an aquatics professional, you need to fulfill your responsibility to any members of your team that may outlast you. Just keep setting them up to succeed and, and asking, um, asking your staff, like, is this my responsibility now? 
long. So like Willis said with um, the CDC, they're, they're putting out a lot of guidance right now, but there's not one size fits all. You need to be thoughtful about where you're getting your information from. But with what's out there right now, there's a couple of areas to focus, which is social distancing. That's going to impact your capacity in one way or another, even if um, your area is under stricter or looser protocols for that. Um, the responsibility of your lifeguards. It, a lot of information that we have right now comes from the North Texas Aquatics Association. They had a talk on April 22nd where they had a couple of representatives from the CDC say that, you know, they're anecdotally, their priority is still bather safety. It's not to be the social distancing police. How are you going to be asking your guards to be more flexible in this time and still maintain their, their primary duty? <clears throat> because um, COVID-19 is going to take a backseat to their duty to act and perform a rescue. So as you take it all in, like Willis said, remember Facebook groups aren't immune to the same kind of comment sections that regular Facebook experiences. You can follow a thread, but make sure you fact check what you're reading. Um, the CDC guidance on going to water parks and pools ultimately is gonna to fall to your state and local authority. The CDC does not have the ability to enforce or make anyone adopt those guidances. So you need to be watching your local news, um, checking in with your local agencies. A lot of us are looking to the model aquatic health code right now. Um, the fourth edition's plan to be published in summer of 2021, but it will not specifically address COVID-19. They've just closed their request process in January. So ask yourself, as an operator, can I open this attraction, this pool, this feature safely? As of right now, I'm personally kind of in a holding pattern with my own site, but I'm starting to put it down. If I'm opening, here's what I want to get done. All the rationale we have on water transmission isn't based on text, uh, excuse me, on testing the actual novel coronavirus, but we're going to do the best with what we have. Um, gentleman named Dewey Case from that North Texas call I referenced uh, shared an article that quoted free residual chlorine over 0.5 ppm in wastewater ensures complete activation of some types of coronavirus that have been tested. But at the same time, you know, you know your system, you know what it can do in, in terms of what you're able to test. Are you using a titrating test kit? Do you have ORP sensors? Do you have free chlorine sensors? Start looking at your, your test kit. We use the pretty standard one from Taylor Technologies, but chances are I'm gonna be getting a little bit of extra DPD powder to make sure we're, we're hitting it right there. Um, I'm gonna be looking to always maintain at least two parts per million free available chlorine. As of right now, my local health department does not um, allow anything lower than one. I think that's pretty standard across the board. But I know if we get a larger group of swimmers coming in, the second they hit the pool, sitting around the bare minimum at the one isn't going to be enough. So looking at your programming, thinking if camp groups are coming in, if that's still happening, um, the second they hit the water, is that free available chlorine going to get eaten up? Um, ORP, I'm going to try to get it as high as I possibly can. Same way Willa mentioned with using lower pHs, uh, basically what the finish is going to tolerate for you. Um, and then whatever your health department allows. We're not allowed to go below 7.2. Ideally, I'd like to get it somewhere around 6.8, but that's not uh, kosher with my local code. Um, what going on there? It, we've got a couple of different offerings at my specific site. We have a, a splash feature, a wading pool, water slides, and two main bodies of flat water. And we're going to be looking at, at least from my perspective, trying to close those higher risk venues whenever we can. Start looking at your facility and ask, can you alter your level of service not to include certain high risk features that have longer turnover times, higher amount of throughput, lower volume? Is there more of a chance that that feature could agitate or aerosolize the water? Um, 
And something I want to ask is like for you folks with secondary disinfection systems, is that still um, something that you're thinking is going to be a piece of communication with your guests, letting them know it's like, yes, we have UV systems, we use ozone. Um, things like that will also go a long way in helping ease the public perception of what you and your facility are doing to keep them safe with the water. Um, and if we're having an extension closure, because right now I, I truly do not know where we are going to go. Hopefully some more information is coming out over the next week that I'm going to look at my calcium hardness. We have plaster pools that um, are about a 10 year refinishing timeline at least budget wise. So I'm going to try to make sure I get the most mileage out of that that I can. And same questions we all should kind of be asking at this point is, are we ramping up or are we winding down? If you're ramping up, getting ready to start the season, make sure you focus on those updates from local authorities. Consider adding another piece to your toolkit of communicating with the public for their safety. If you can get your hands on a bacteriological water testing kit to, to show that your water that's been sitting there has stayed safe, clean, usable. Um, and I'll pop a link for that in the show notes in a moment. Um, network and collaborate with similar operations. That's kind of what we've been doing here with this committee and it's been a, a huge resource I think for all of us. So thanks again to, to Katie for getting this all together. And then are your regularly contracted services still operating? Do you have an extended lead time on purchasing PPE? Are your first aid supplies no longer gonna be the latex gloves? Do you need nitrile or other things going to have to substitute and does that work for you? And then things like paper products and cleaning supplies. I, I spoke with our paper product supplier a few weeks ago and they said, yeah, we don't have any hand sanitizer until mid-April. Now I call again come mid-April and now we're looking at early June. So those timelines are going to be shifting. Um, if you're winding down, the CDC has released specific guidance on draining your spas and hot tubs, anything like that that could host Legionella. They're uh, provided guidance on how to do so. Uh, just a little personal tip from how I've winterized in the past. Uh, if you have a butterfly valve, um, there's no water behind it, put it at half, the, getting those things unstuck in a pump room after trying to start up your summarization process is a total pain. And then if you've got those documented winterizing procedures for you outdoor folks, drain anything that's gonna hold water um, and make sure that your things like hydrostatic valves are operating good, that you're once again checking those VGB drain covers, anything that could slip past if you're not actively thinking about it. And then if you are still running, um, you know, in that holding pattern of, all right, well, let's scale this back a little bit, double check your, your NLOX on your chemical feed. You don't want to have any sort of unintentional chemical injection that causes chlorine gas um, because your automation system didn't have a fully functioning probe or there was some other issue there that led to that happening and you weren't the one around. Um, little thing I picked up over the years in having a few overdoses of chlorine overnight because of a bad probe is bricking your feed lines. Take a take a cinder block, a brick, something like that, the little three-eighths inch poly tube that dips into your reserve tank. Just have it halfway down. Don't stick it at the full bottom. So if it does overfeed, you're not going to drain the whole tank. And last, just really make sure you're listening to those jurisdictional authorities. We can all consume this information over and over and over again, but until you start taking ownership of what's being said in your part of the conversation, that nothing is going to change. Um, your local health department will be releasing guidance. They'll have an idea, or they may not even know. Um, check out those CDC guidelines. Follow what's happening in your state and local level. And that's about all I got. So I'll let Katie move us along. Awesome. Thank you so much, Evan. I love a lot of the points that you shared, especially reiterating some of the things Willa said. And I think all of our people will say is that stakeholder communication is huge. I think we 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 need to proactively communicate. Often we take the perspective that we're the client when we are an aquatic facility manager and we wait for our suppliers to contact us because they want to make the sale. 
we need to proactively contact everyone at all levels across lines. It's a lot of email writing, but creating those proactive plans will keep you in the forefront of whether it's the mayor, council, um, upper management, suppliers, that really should be a list of everyone you need. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to, Evan, you can turn off your camera. I believe uh, we have. I, I will say I've shared one thing in the chat box, yeah. just a, a quick article from our, our executive director on that collaboration if you need some, some inspiration there. Yeah, please. And all of those resources from our different presenters today, we'll put those on the show notes. It'll take me a couple days to get the next show notes up just because I'm teaching uh, CPO this week as well. So lots of web time. Let me go ahead, Adam. I believe we've got Adam next. And then on deck after that will be Drew. So Adam, I'm just going to unlock your mic and camera. And you will be able to move your slides ahead. I'll just move the, the next one. One second. Oh, one second. So Adam, do you want to try testing out talking? Hey, everybody. It's Adam. Can you let us know, guys, that you can hear Adam in the chat box? Perfect. Ooh. And you can advance the slides yourself, Adam. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. I uh, just wanted to get started. I put this presentation together, um, and I've shared it with a few folks. So if you've seen it, um, it, it might be a little bit of repeat. But I, I always wanted to start this presentation out with just a picture of why I'm here and what I'm um, waiting to get back to so just something nice for us to look at that's Barton Springs pool there um, again my name is Adam Thompson I work with the city of Austin I'm the aquatic supervisor for Barton Springs pool and deep eddy pool I think I took that picture out of the slideshow but it's another freshwater pool so you guys are in Austin love to see y'all come down and check out the pool um, Barton Springs is the fourth largest spring in Texas so that's pretty neat it's year-round about 68 degrees so we are in it every month of the year we also operate 40 or 44 other pools and splash pads so 33 pools 11 splash pads across the city we try to hire 800 lifeguards in the summer um, this year we're not going to do that due to some of the operational changes that were kind of mentioned earlier we're, we're feeling that as well um, but we do currently have 200 staff on payroll and our staff is working and they are um, engaging in other non-parks and rec activities. So there's a lot of communication that needs to happen with our staff and so we are um, doing our best to do that. And that's what I'm here to talk with you guys about today. Virtual in-service. Um, so like I said, our staff was still working. So we really felt the need to be able to have that central communication um, with our staff and our um, in-service is something that we really try to make a, a part of our culture. So we didn't want to get away from in-service um, during this time. We wanted to still make that a regular routine for people to show up to in-service. I think our staff really appreciates us all coming together and then taking the time to do the in-service as well. They've really enjoyed the topics. Um, go into that in a little bit. But overall, today we're going to be talking about um, virtual in-service, so just different requirements, why you might want to do it. I alluded to some of ours just then. Platform, so uh, today we're on Click Meeting, um, but there's tons of different ones. Zoom has, I think, been one of the most popular ones during all this. Um, content, we're going to talk about what we show during the in-services. And engagement, so it's um, very important to make sure that you're engaging the, the group. So kudos to Katie and the group on here. Um, I like the engagement. and making sure that we're active in the chat. We try to do a lot of the same things on our in-services and reporting. So, you know, once you've done your in-service, you need to be able to, um, or at least we needed to be able to document um, who all went. And so we'll, we'll talk about some of the reporting elements. Requirements, so as I mentioned, um, it's our, it's an agency policy that we have that the staff must attend um, an hour of in-service per week. So we wanted to continue to maintain that. Um, it, we follow the Texas Public Pool Code. So that's outlined in the Texas Public Pool Code. And so we wanted to continue to meet that. Um, StarGuard is our um, lifeguarding provider. And while they have um, you know, addressed the in-service requirement to their licensing during this COVID crisis, we still just want to maintain the, the staff 
in service for that piece as well. And then another thing that I kind of lumped into the requirements, it sticks out a little bit, but payroll. Um, I think if you're asking people to do online in-services, uh, they're gonna be at their house. So the question, uh, you know, is can you pay them? Um, also important to note that we don't provide any technology for our staff to complete these. So this has all been on their um, you know, own devices and phones and computers. So those are just other things to consider. And I'll reference back to that as we um, talk about some of the other considerations for a virtual end service. So platform, as I mentioned, we're on click to meeting today. Um, a lot of these platforms are fairly similar and they do they do a lot of the same things, um, but it's important to learn exactly how each platform works before you jump on. So last week we had a, a planning call to make sure this was gonna go smoothly for you guys today. That's the same thing um, that you're gonna wanna do when you're getting something ready for your staff. Um, so we have about 200 lifeguards right now that are attending the in-services. We do two in-services, 100, generally 100 people per in-service. Um, so Microsoft Teams is what we use, and we can have that many people in the room. But depending on your staff size, that might be something that you need to look for a different tool. Or if you have a relatively small staff, something like Facebook or a conference call might go ahead and get the um, get the job done. I know my sister's a nurse, and they definitely have a lot of nurses at the hospital, but um, they've still, through all this, just posted Facebook videos to update the, the different members of the staff there. So... Um, you know, just whatever fits your culture. Um, more than anything, I recommend that you try to find what your agency or what resources are free that you already have. Um, if it's something that your agency already has, they can help you with the IT support because you are going to be the um, head honcho on this. Your staff is going to look to you for guidance for technical difficulties. Um, but don't let that scare you away, guys. Um, you'll also find that your staff probably knows some of these platforms as well or better than you. Um, they have definitely helped us out. Um, again, technical requirements. So we don't provide anything for folks. So when we're driving some of the engagement, you know, we have to think about, you know, not everybody has a mic or not everybody has a webcam or some people have issues accessing the chat. It's just things that you have to consider and, and work through with your staff. Um, as I mentioned, you are the IT expert, so you kind of have to know some of the common errors to your platform and how people can walk through or correct them. Um, for us, Microsoft Teams seems to crash whenever they try to hit the notification button for the chat. So we just direct them to click the chat button manually rather than follow the notification. Um, let's see, next slide. Content. Uh, so this is really important, y'all. Um, there's two slides on content, content, and that's because it's very important. Um, you want to keep it interesting and fresh. Um, you don't want to repeat the same things every week. Your staff might catch on to that. Um, so make sure you're, you're switching it up and thinking about it just like a regular in-service. Uh, we all have that ability to plan in-services. So, um, you know, it's just kind of moving from the pool deck to the online platform. Um, but generally we start our um, in-services with the five to 10 minutes of housekeeping, various things that the staff needs to know as they were um, changing some of the city, or not city ordinances, but um, city orders that we've been following right now related to mask wearing and things like that. We've continued to update the staff on those weekly calls. Um, We've reached out during this time to our uh, vendors and partners. So some of that collaboration you guys were talking about before um, with your vendors, send them an email, tell them, you know, like for instance, our scheduling company, um, I have a monthly call with them and I had to tell them last month that you know, we're not gonna hit our number that, or we're not likely to hit our number this year um, for the scheduling software. And they understand, you know, um, and with that same call, they actually offered to um, come on our in-service and do a presentation over our scheduling app. So that was really fantastic. You know, we've learned how to use the scheduling app here, but it's nice to have the representatives from the company on and showing the app from a, a different perspective. I think our staff kind of gets maybe tired of our voice after some time. So it's just nice to uh, mix it up a little bit. As I mentioned, StarGuard is our uh, lifeguard provider. So they came on and did a presentation as well as Starfish Aquatics. So it was really great to have them 
um, come out and do some sessions. Our internal human resources safety division came on and did a session over employee safety. Um, and let's see, I think the first one I did was customer service. I see some questions in the chat about um, content. So I did customer service the first week just to make sure we got it off the ground before we brought in the partners. But it's been um, almost partner led on all these in services, which is great because as Katie mentioned, you know, we're kind of in front of the screen all day long. At least I know I am um, having conversations. And then so by time four, we do our evenings at our in services in the evenings, four to five o'clock. I know I'm about burnt out on talking. So it's really nice to bring some other people on and let them really take the lead on the in service. Um, and then as you can kind of pick up from the, the content I shared with you guys, um, we are not really focusing on water skills at this time. Um, I think as we move towards a, um, a reopening date that we will definitely be looking at um, showing some of those just videos from the lifeguard classes on the in-service. I think that's going to be um, beneficial to our staff. Um, and then this week is our first um, swim lessons instructor type in service. So we're getting a little bit closer back to the water, I guess you would say, um, but we're going to start showing some water safety stuff this week. So really excited for that. Um, I think that's something swim lessons are a big part of our agency. And so it's just, it's great anytime you can get extra time to share the swim lesson and water safety um, skills with the staff. It's, it's not something that we always have the most time for. So really use these in services to think about it and maybe hit some topics that, you know, you've been wanting to hit for a while. The customer service that was one for us is something I've wanted to tackle for a while. Um, content, like I said, guys, it's important. I heard somebody talking about the memes, um, COVID memes. So that's great. You know, don't be afraid to use memes. I think they can help if that's a part of your organizational culture. Um, that's why I put one. I think they're funny. If you get an email from me, you're pretty likely to get a meme in it. Ask any of my coworkers. Um, but they might not be appropriate for your in service. So, you know, just um, take into consideration your organization and definitely consider what meme you're using um, with the audience that your, your lifeguard staff is. Um, so the scheduling app, we were able to share the mobile screen and walk the staff through how to use their app on there. So that was really cool. We typically do slideshows for most of the end services. Um, and we've pulled up a couple websites and shown some videos. So um, the options are out there. Um, you might also just want to get on and have a conversation with your staff. Um, it's just not something that we've 100% done yet. Um, engagement, so a couple things to consider. Um, your group size, as I mentioned already, that's also going to drive how you engage your staff. So for us, if 100 people, I don't really consider it a, a realistic goal to have everybody engage on the microphone or chat during the, the end service. So um, then, you know, it's just a consideration whenever you're doing your end service. Not to say that we don't use the chat because believe me, we do. Our chat is um, very popular and we typically have two or three people monitoring the chat um, and assisting with Q&A during the presentation. That way we um, are timely and finish up on time. Um, it's also just good to remind your staff that they need to keep it professional, um, both on the microphone and in the chat. Um, so we, we do that a couple times, especially in the beginning of the call. Um, our platform doesn't allow us to have everybody in this audience versus presenter mode. So we're constantly muting everyone's mics as they join, but it hasn't been too big of an issue. Um, Q&A, that's your personal um, choice there, but um, we always have a few minutes at the end for that. Um, likewise, we're usually on the meeting early and late just to hang out and talk with staff if they have questions, um, if they're having difficulties at the end of the meeting with uh, getting to the quiz or something like that, we're there to help with that. Um, and that's the other thing for the chat monitors, it's really good for them to help with the troubleshooting. Um, once the presenter's going, you know, it's kind of hard for them to help somebody restart and close their app. So the chat monitors are usually the ones who will field a lot of those questions.
reporting. Um, so as I alluded to, you, you know, um, reporting is going to fit your needs. Um, for us, the biggest goals are, um, are people paying attention? Were they listening? Did they learn anything? Um, and then attendance so we can track it for their in-service logs, which um, also leads us to attendance for payroll. So um, the link right there in the slideshow is probably live and the QR code is probably live too if any of you guys want to check out our quiz. Um, we just use Microsoft Forms and um, we create a new quiz every week. Everybody goes in, takes the, the quiz and we are able to generate an Excel report, see if anybody you know, wasn't paying attention during the in-service. We reach out to them and figure out if they were having technical issues or, or what the situation was. Um, and then we're also able to quickly put that into payroll with that Excel sheet. So it's, it's been really beneficial for us. Um, Bitly.com is a resource I wanted to share with you guys. As you start sharing these links for sharing the meetings, some of them are really long. So if you, if you go to Bitly, it'll just shorten your link down for you. Um, and I, I didn't go into it too much earlier, but um, you know these are all just the platforms that we use, Microsoft Forms, Microsoft Teams. Um, Tons of options out there. Survey Monkey is probably one. Um, just reach out and dig around. I'm sure you guys will find a solution that works well for you. And with that, I think that's about it. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Adam. Adam is joining us. We got connected with Adam through Ashley, uh, who was on our high volume committee. So Adam, thank you so much. It's interesting, I think, to look at the trajectory of online because initially, for me anyway, I can speak for myself, early March, online was cool, I signed up for everything, and now we're at the end of April, and certainly any opportunity to not be on camera, not be live, to dial in by phone, I think we have to really, <laughs> we have to take advantage of that too and be aware that our employees, they're Zooming with grandparents, they're Zooming with cousins, right? So. Um, if anybody needs ideas for in-service topics, that's been coming up in the chat box a little bit. If you've done an in-service that you have a short lesson plan for or a mini topic that you're willing to share, pop that in the chat box or email that to me at katie at lakeviewaquaticconsultants.com. I'll put my email in the chat box and we can put those on the resource, or excuse me, on the show notes page because I know we're all drained and tired. So if, if somebody has a great topic, like I love what you said, Adam, about delegating to other departments that really should have FaceTime with our staff, but they're perhaps evenings and weekends and HR doesn't wanna come in evenings and weekends. Now is a great time to get in health and safety, to get in HR, to get in if you have a union, your union reps, to get in customer service training from the front end. All of those can help you with your workload especially like I do with these webinars, right? I ask people who are already subject matter experts in their area, and it's very quick for them to put together a session than for me to research, design, and deliver. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, let's keep the conversation going in the chat box with resources, but I want to move on to Drew, Andrew Yorkie. Thank you, Adam. You can turn off your mic. I think you've already done that. Andrew, let me unlock your mic and camera. I, whichever you choose to use is good. And we'll hear from Drew. We'll just give him a second. I was late authorizing that. Yeah, it's working just one sec. Oh. Try again, Drew. We had you for a second. I don't know about your audio. So sh there we go, perfect. So I'm going to, it's just loading for me. I have the slowest internet. Oh, thinking. Can you guys hear me? I can, I'm gonna mute myself chat box, let Andrew know that you can hear him, per perfect. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background before I start, my name is Drew Yorkie. Uh, I am the safety coordinator over at UC uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, my background is in aquatics. Uh, I've worked at aquatics facilities in Georgia, Arizona, and now in California. Um, our aqu aquatic facilities have uh, three pools overall, and during the summer, we have a surf and kayak camp and junior lifeguards. 
So we usually have over 200 staff that we hire during the summer, but we are open year round as a collegiate uh, aquatics facility. Um, and hopefully today I wanna go through some more tools that we can possibly use uh, going forward to help us open. Um, our other presenters have gave us a lot of different tools and things to think about. And I hope uh, I can do that from a risk management point as well um, here. So first thing I wanna go through is journey mapping. Uh, first time I heard this was on a, a Connect2 call. Uh, journey mapping is just a timeline uh, that touches all points between a user and a product. Uh, that's the definition of it. But uh, when we want to use this, we wanna look at our, our patrons coming through our doors and when they come from the front door to the pool, what are all, they all touching, right? What's gonna be need, need to clean the most? Do you have uh, uh, doors that open up to the pool that are going to be touched every time somebody opens or comes through it? Are there going to be uh, swiping cards that people have to go through and swipe in or turn styles that they're going to have to touch to come in? Um, and just walking through and looking at the eyes of the patrons and everything you touch, mark it. Just put something on there, write it down saying, hey, all right, this is something that's going to be touched a lot or this is going to be touched more. And so maybe we should look at cleaning this a little bit more. You also want to do this for your staff, right? Those people who are checking people into the front desk, uh, they're picking up the phone to answer it, right? Uh, we might not think that that's something that we need to clean, but maybe looking into that while we're sitting behind the desk in their eyes. And so just walking through step by step to see what, what we're doing. Um, I included a, a Google photo from, or a Google Maps photo. Uh, this is from Arizona State uh, Aquatics Facility where I used to work. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to take this map, uh, this picture, and just give you an example. So I'm a patron, I'm walking through, am I gonna put my stuff down on this table that's to the left? Am I gonna be touching those chairs, right? This is a very open facility, so there might be less things to touch, but uh, that guard stand up in the right corner, right? Guards are gonna be climbing up and down it, so maybe we should clean that a little bit more. Uh, and so it's just a tool for us when we open up just to think about uh, and just to think, okay, how can I be more cleanly instead of just thinking, all right, we're gonna need to clean more. What's the steps to get there? And I'm hoping this can help you get to those steps. Another thing I learned on, on uh, one of these Connect2 concept calls is this risk matrix. We all know, or we may or may not know that risk matrix are a thing, but they showed us this outline. So I will give them a little bit of a shout out. Uh, we use them as a wireless app. It's a mobile app. Uh, we can do accident incident reports as put our uh, standard operating procedures on this uh, or emergency action plans that are all digital. digital. Um, and so I, I did give them that shout out because they opened this up, um, but maybe creating your own risk matrix. So as you're doing that journey mapping, going through as well, thinking, all right, how many people are going to be in this area as we open, right? And you can see at the top, we can have just a different level of exposures that we think people are going to be in. And you can change this value to people to space in an area, different things, just to give you a little bit more of your likelihood of maybe contracting something if you have a multitude of people in an area. So looking into making a risk matrix for you and your, your organization or uh, putting something together, that gives you just a little bit more of an idea of what areas may be more at risk. Uh, you can see kind of in this PowerPoint, the identified risks of like open lane swim versus group swim lessons versus pool equipment and locker rooms, uh, just as a couple of examples for that. Uh, I see there's a question of, is there an app for risk matrix? Uh, no, there's not. But if you look up what a, just the definition of a risk matrix, um, it's just a, a document that you kind of, what I put in here is just different numerical numbers and then it populates as I type in the risk severity for that area that we define as risky uh, to add up to that number for that. Um, and I cannot give a sample of this race, uh, risk matrix because it is by Connect2, um, but I can give their contact information um, and their websites so you can look into that there. Uh, moving into some employee safety. Uh, so what are ways to keep our employees safe while we're working during these times and social distancing? Um, a great tool just to start off where we're like, how do we keep them safe? Where do we even start? Um, the United States White House put out a openings uh, America document. 
Um, and it just provides a nice few points to look into. Um, this was brought to our attention by Dr. Sumstrat. If you didn't see his presentation, I have links into that as well. Um, but the document in this PowerPoint is uh, straight to the White House document. So some things we wanna look at, social distancing and protective equipment, right? Temperature checks, making sure our staff are being checked regularly. And if they're sick, uh, I saw earlier we talked about that, just making an avenue to where they know there's no repercussions uh, if they do feel sick so that when we come back, when they come back, they're not spreading something uh, that may or may not be what we hope it's not. Um, sanitizing everything, even in their areas, and then using disinfectants in common areas, right? <clears throat> so Dr. Semtrot, uh, Kate, Katie put that link in the show or in the comment section, but he gave us just a little bit of insight of duty of care. Um, because our staff are medical professionals. Uh, they do have that requirement. And for uh, in the hospital setting, what he was talking about is they do not treat people who are not suspected of COVID or a confirmed case of COVID any differently. Um, there are different ways of caring for them, but I will refer back to his show notes and I would want you to go watch those. I don't wanna speak on that um, since it's already been spoken on. And again, as everyone's been following up with following the CDC and OSHA guidelines uh, for here in America, I don't know the Canadian equivalent to that, um, but that is something that you might want or you should be referring to as we are continuing employee safety. I know in California, OSHA put out uh, uh, ash and smoke uh, air quality guidelines after so many fires that are coming out. Uh, and so I foresee OSHA putting out employee guidelines as well. Um, and then going through more, a little bit more, uh, during the Texas call, uh, if some of you were there, the CDC had a Q&A uh, where they said lifeguards will probably be wearing masks on stand, uh, but removing them if they go in for a rescue. Um, and when we're asking our guards to provide care, how are we removing that suspected or confirmed COVID case from our facilities? And maybe one of the ways to doing that is screening people, whether that's uh, taking temperatures, asking a questionnaire, a combination of both. It's going to come down to what your organization wants for that. And uh, that's really all that I have for my presentation in there. I do see a question if guards are wearing masks on stands, how are they using their whistle? Um, I'm gonna refer back to Dr. Sumstrat's uh, method of whenever we're gonna be providing care as well to a suspected or confirmed COVID case, he kept harping on, it's like a firefighter going to a, a burning building. We get our gear on first, we protect ourselves, and then we do things. So if they're wearing a, a mask on stand and then you blow their whistle, pop it off real quick, blow the whistle, pop it back on. So thank you, Drew. I wanna just mention a couple things that we've sidebarred about in our high volume committee that I think are pertinent for the group is just thinking about everybody on this webinar, what will be your organization's perspective if an employee contracts COVID at work? What does that look like for your insurance, for your workplace policies? I know that's a, an HR, usually an HR specific question and typically risk management may not be in your portfolio directly. You may have a separate risk manager, risk manager in your organization. But I really think every question or decision that we make in aquatics right now, post COVID reopening, we have to look at what could go wrong. If I let my guards on stand and they don't have masks, could they get sick? What is that rabbit trail that we often ignore? Uh, what are some different things that we need to do that way? Okay, so just one second. Okay, I would just, I can't, I'm multitasking here. Um, anybody else have any quick questions for Drew? I know not everybody has a risk management background. So if you've got a quick question for him, I wanna, uh, get them for him if anyone has any questions. Um, I, I think we've got a lot of good learning. We are typically, we start to finish up around this time. So I want to say thank you to all of our presenters. I'll wait a second while we see who's typing, but 
I want to say thank you. We've had, I'm just looking at my list. Heather wasn't able to join us, but sent some information to Willa. We had Willa from Reston, Virginia, Evan McGarren from, uh, forgive me, Nova Parks, uh, we had Adam from Austin, Texas, and then Drew Yorkie here from UC Santa Barbara. So thank you, everyone. There are lots of aspects to reopening, and I know everybody is struggling and wondering what to do and working in silos. So just try and, I, I guess the last thing I want to end on for me, if there's no questions, is pick the most vital thing. Don't, I think, agonize over lane swim until you have lane swimmers. Focus on the safety. So what does it look like to get your pool full of water? What does it look like to get your, you know, your staff in the door for training, for orientation? Take it in chronological order. You're not going to have swimming lessons until you have a pool full of water. And then you're not going to have swimming lessons until you have staff. So try and think sequentially. I'll stay on the call for a few more minutes. We'll let Andrew go. Everybody's got lots lots to do. It's a new week. If you have questions for me, I am here. The PowerPoints are available on the show notes page, which I've pinned in the chat box. A uh, couple questions. I'm just looking. Kim, if you're looking for World Health Organization approved sanitizer for good surfaces, look at your distilleries. Angela is asking, how do we go about screening at the door in a legal way? I don't know, Andrew, if you have any comments on that. I suspect that might be a legal actual lawyer question. Yeah, I would definitely go through your legal on that. But just as a, uh, some questions to pose to them is potentially just, have you been around anyone who's been confirmed? Have you shown any symptoms in the past uh, uh, 14 days kind of thing? Um, and if they, they answer it in a non-honest uh, way, uh, we take their temperature and then we allow them to walk through the door. Unfortunately, uh, there, there's only so much we can do, especially with so much information still evolving as well. And knowing that there are a lot of asymptomatic people there. So I heard something really great on a, on, I, forgive me. I have no idea where I heard it last week or the week before, but some organization I was talking to, they were doing, um, questioning their employees about their character. So asking about their behaviors during physical distancing to get a sense of how compliant they've been with physical restrictions. So not saying like, oh, have you visited your girlfriend during quarantine, but more just what activities have you been doing to stay busy so that the organization could gauge for themselves how compliant the individual has been during physical distancing protocol. And I thought that was a really smart, indirect way, like, hey, what have you been up to the last six weeks? that would inform me as a supervisor without getting into, in Canada, we have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and without getting into illegal questioning, right? So, um, and then I think, I see Willa's question as well, what are we doing with temperatures and questionnaires for entrance? I think there's a whole rabbit trail in terms of privacy and then a requirement to document or asking information that we may not have the authorization to ask. So lots of questions, I think we'll, We'll end it there for today. Reminder that on Wednesday, we have the Junior Lifeguard Club session. That link is already in the show notes. I will go ahead and also pop in our links for Friday. So Jason Simituk is here talking about making aquatics a winner. I know that title is confusing. What that means is advocating for aquatics in different situations where you're competing for money with different organizations. So maybe the fire department, the library, how do you forcefully advocate for aquatics? That is the session on Friday. And then on Monday of next week, we have mermaiding and lifeguard camp, which is a fun session for everyone. So uh, if you're looking for other sessions, go to our website, the show notes are in the chat box. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And we'll see you again on Wednesday. Bye-bye.